Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You join us here outside the Ministry of Defence in, in a cold, rather blustery London. Um, we're standing in front of the statue of Lord Portal of Hungerford, who was Chief of the Air Staff during the Second World War. More importantly for our course, he was a squadron commander and a pilot of RE8s, earning two military crosses and a distinguished service order as he went through the war. So when it came to formulating uh, doctrine, policy and so forth in the interwar years, they were able to rely on people of real operational experience. I'm joined this morning by Dr. James Pugh, who's uh, recently finished his PhD with us at Birmingham, and you'll have met him on some of the, um, the message boards and the forums during the course of the last week. What are you doing here in, in London, James? Uh, well, out, outside of having a, dis a discussion with you, Peter, I'm off to the National Archives at Kew today. Um, the goal of that research, I'm looking at RAF Bomber Command during the Second World War and having a look at issues relating to aviation, medicine and fatigue. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's, be it's, it's, it's always a fascinating experience to get down, you know, in into the archives and do, you know, the bread and butter stuff of what historians do. Okay, that sounds really good. Um... What are the main themes that have been coming up in the the posts in on the forums? <laughs> it's been it's been a very very busy week so far on the forums. I suspect the first question that comes up is when course participants are confronted with you reading Tennyson, and they've signed up for an aviation <coughs> course and they think, well, what's going on here? So, I mean, could you offer us anything on why do we begin with a um with with poetry? Tennyson? Yeah, well, quite. Yeah. <coughs> well, it's certainly not because I'm a an English student or anything else. But one of the themes that we've introduced this week has been the fear and the fascination. And part of the fascination stems in my mind from this idea that aviation's only 10 years old by the beginning of the First World War. But there's this huge understanding, fascination that goes far beyond the tiny amounts of technology. And Tennyson, H.G. Wells, and many of the bits that have been brought up as we've been through the, the week, all stem from the, where did this all come from? And part of it is from sources like Tennyson. So I thought it worth exploring this as an area, where were people getting their inspiration from? I think that's a really, really interesting, but like, if I could just add a couple of points on that. I think uh, in the discussions I've had, it's been relating to the value of exploring poetry. And I think it's about the culture and atmosphere of that time as you've alluded to you know it's the environment in which a lot of these young aviators if they're not the pioneers they're the aviators that fly aircraft during the first first world war they're brought up on this stuff they're taught it at school and it's just it's just sort of embedded in their oh. psyche almost yes i think that's absolutely right um, and if i could make a, a very small recommendation on the reading list is a is a text by michael paris called winged warfare uh, which certainly looks and explores at the value of predictive fiction prior to and during the First World War. So worth exploring that if, if you have the time. It's one of those things that the, the aviation bit just does not occur in a bubble. It's in the <laughs> wider military sense. Absolutely. It's in the wider societal sense. And these are things just to think about, both as you go through this course and as you look into wider military history. It happens in a big context. Yeah, I mean, I think another point, and again, linking to the wider context, is we have a discussion point relating to um, lions led by donkeys, a particular pers perspective on generalship during the First World War. And the question comes again, we're doing an aviation loop, why are we talking about this? I think the first point to make on that is, again, it's the wider context. It wasn't the Royal Air Force until 1918. The Royal Flying Corps, as you all know, was an integral part of the British Army, and they were effectively being led by the same generals. More importantly, from the historian's point of view, one of the things that we have to look at are the myths that have grown up over the years. And these myths come for a reason. There's been a narrative which has been constructed. As historians, part of our job is to deconstruct this narrative and to try and find out what the real story was, and more importantly, in some cases, why this story has grown up. Part of that story was that aviation had been poo-hooed. Classic Blackadder type quotation, 
from a Blackadder type background. So one of the things that we look at in that is, where did this come from? Is it real? Is it part of the same phenomenon? And the phenomenon of lions led by donkeys and the historical debate, which still goes on, were they lions? Were they donkeys? Or was there a real story of leadership and progression? And I tend to think that the leadership of the Royal Flying Corps was not without criticisms over the First World War and beyond into the years of the Royal Air Force can only be really studied and understood in the context of this generalship and the lions led by donkeys debate. No, no, I think that's a fantastic point, Peter. And I think that a lot of the comments come up um, have been based around these sort of, there are myths in popular consciousness relating to the First World War that um, individuals such as Sir Douglas Haig, who commands the BF from 1915 onwards, and Sir John French, who um, he uh, he's su su supersedes, they're individuals that they're old fashioned, they are Luddites, they don't understand technology for them. It's all about getting, you know, getting the horses and breaking through through the lines. And when you get into the archival record and you look at the men uh, of the archival papers of Sir John French or Haig, you actually find that from a very, very early point, prior to the First, First World War, they have a good understanding of what air power can deliver. And they're very, very, very <coughs> supportive of the efforts of the Royal, of the Royal Flying Corps. That's absolutely right. And it, you don't even have to go into the archives. You merely have to look at the official histories <laughs> yeah. to see the, the value of reconnaissance, the value of what's been going on, both in the army maneuvers leading up to the First World War and in the early weeks and days of the First World War itself. And this ability not just to see over the first hill, but to see more generally across a whole battlefield is worth its weight in gold. All of the army records, all of the army field service regulations aren't talking about cavalry, cavalry, cavalry. They're talking about the interaction between cavalry and the new arm aircraft and how they can be best used to greatest advantage. You've done a lot of this work in terms of your PhD. Yeah, so. I, I mean, I think in terms of, in terms of, and I've mentioned this on the on the comments boards a few a few times, but a figure we, we really need to acknowledge and he's not widely acknowledged in the history, is a, a chap called Sir David Henderson. Um, David Henderson is the first commander of the Royal Flying Corps during the First, first World War, takes the Royal Flying Corps through to about the middle of 1915. He's also the Director General of Military Aeronautics. And one of the really, really important things about, Dave, is about David Henderson is at a very young age, he understands the young age in terms of his military career, I should say. He understands the importance of air power. And he understands that senior commanders within the British Army might be a bit sceptical about this because it does threaten their understanding of warfare. And that's never really a very nice place to be faced with. Change is a very difficult process to manage for individuals and organisations. And David Henderson's crucial role is, is selling air power to senior commanders in the Brit Brit British Army. Absolutely. Doing it in a language that they understand. He's not scaring them. He's saying, this is a fantastic thing. This, this, this can support your cavalry on the ground. This can support your armour later in the war. And it's, um, he plays an absolutely fundamental role in, in, in the creation of the Royal Flying Corps and its integration into uh, the British Army. That's really interesting. We frequently refer to Trenchard as the father of the Royal Air Force. I think it's instructive to call David Henderson the father of the Royal Flying Corps. He was indeed that. What other points have we had over the week? Um, one really interesting <laughs> point, um, perhaps reflecting contemporary opinions about government, is that governments at the time, prior to the First World War, were really very, very slow in grasping this, in grasping the significance of air power. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I think the military generally and the government slow to react. I think that's probably a bit harsh. You know, we're in an ideal position sitting outside the Ministry of Defence. I've worked long enough in those <laughs> hallowed halls to know that things do grind on at a fairly slow pace. But I think in terms of grasping aviation, it's another one of those myths that has grown up that they were desperately slow and desperately conservative. When you look at the actual investment that went into the aeroplanes, into the people, I think they're actually quite forward-looking and it's a better story than comes out of the myths.
No, no, I think that's absolutely fair. I, th <coughs> I mean, they certainly do take their time, um, as do all organisations of that yeah. size. But I think, more importantly, they're taking their time because this is just completely unprecedented. They've, they've, they, 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 there is no knowledge about this. They are building, I think, uh, I think the historian... Eric Ash says they're building without bricks. They, 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 they literally have no knowledge upon which to base this. It's all very spec, speculative. And so any investment they make is, is quite a progressive decision at that point. That's absolutely right, James. And I think we also, I come back to the classic Sir Michael Howard uh, advice of studying things in depth, in breadth, and in particular in context. And what we have to bear in mind, the context of the time, was that the British Army was not prepared, was not wanting to go to war in an expeditionary start. So the whole thing was moving at a fairly slow pace because it was contrary to what they were set up to do. This wasn't imperial policing. This was major scale leading to total war. They're bound to be slow in coming to terms with that. I think just to add another point on that as well is that if you look at spending <coughs> in regards to defence prior to the First World War. Even the Royal Navy, the, the premier service in Britain, you know, the, the service that literally is keeping Britain's arterial lifelines open around the empire and just keeping the home nation safe, they are struggling to get enough money to be able to buy enough dreadnoughts that they, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't feel they have enough. If you look at the, the naval estimates, like, I don't recall it. It's, it's prior to the First World War. Winston Churchill, as First Lord of the Admiralty then, has, has, has a tremendously difficult time in securing enough budget for the needs of that service as a whole. Yes, pretty much as we are today. Yeah. Defence is always quite low down in the priorities <laughs> until you actually start the war. Preparing for the war is a different matter. So I think you'll agree we've had a really interesting week for the first week of this MOOC. We've got another two weeks to go. What's coming up next week, James? Um, we are exploring the, the First World War in more depth. So this, this week, again, as you've said, the importance of context. We've set the context for actually looking at air power in the context of the First World War. Um, and we'll explore how, I think in your terms, the white heat of that conflict, how that affects the development of aviation um, between 1914 and 1918. We'll also conclude, which I think is a, from discussions with participants on the board, is something everyone's really looking to, forward to getting their teeth into, is where on earth the Royal Air Force comes from. And, and, and that's going to be a really crucial part of that next week. There are some interesting bits of that. There are various myths, there are various tales, there are various legends about it. And the continuing theme of the fear and the fascination of flight will continue next week. But we'll also look at some of these myths and we'll see whether they stand the test of time, whether they hold water, or whether they've just arisen for different reasons. Look forward to seeing you all next week, and we'll look forward to catching up with you at the end of the week. Thank you. Thanks.